What are the real acts of God? What did he really do? We tried to contact God to ask him, but he's not been seen since he sent his son out to meet the press 2,000 years ago. Perhaps, through his omnipotent prophecy, he learned the lessons of Muhammad and Saif Islam Gaddafi, and realized that, after being responsible for genocide, murder, rape, torture, enslavement, incest, and infanticide, if telling your people to continue worshipping you doesn't work, and putting your son forward with promises of peace and love, backed up with threats of all hell and eternal torment doesn't work either, then perhaps it's best to make yourself scarce. So we are left to fall back on the words attributed to God in the book we call the Bible. Understanding, of course, that this book, like the Little Green Book, the Little Red Book, Mein Kampf and many others, might not truly reflect the intentions of the author, and accepting also that much of the book, and especially the New Testament, is indeed a fabrication, as we know that all the texts were inaccurately copied by hand, edited, redacted, and copied again and again, many, many times, over the centuries before being codified. And the many Gospels, books and letters omitted from the Bible were left out on the basis of human selectivity, diplomacy, politics and consensus, rather than any divine instruction. And only the most blindly faithful would still affirm that the authorship of the text is as detailed in the Bible, and that those who do affirm this have yet to explain how Moses came to write the historic details of his own death and burial in Deuteronomy. So anyway, what does the Bible have to say about the acts of God? We shall skip the multiple creations of everything and the trick with the fruit and the snake, pausing only to remember that in the beginning means that before God created everything, there was nothing. Before God created them, there was no matter, no energy, no time, no morals, no sin, no evil, you would do well to remember this, God created sin. And for those that deny this and blame Satan, who created Satan? If God created Satan, then God created sin. If God did not create Satan, well, you can tear up the whole damn Bible. We'll pick up the story after God's big screw up in the Garden of Eden and run through his acts. So here we are on page 5 of the King James Bible and our all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing God has so far, supposedly, created a perfect universe and a perfect earth and a perfect Garden of Eden and a much less than perfect Satan, created two perfect innocent people and put them in his garden, allowed Satan to enter the garden and tempt those two innocent people, damned them both for being tempted by Satan, an angel so powerful and full of guile that he was prepared to challenge God's very authority in heaven, kicked the two out of the garden, rendering all the work he'd put into creating it a waste of time and effort, spurned their firstborn because he resented being punished from birth for the sins of his parents and would not offer burnt sacrifices in penitence, God does love the smell of Balaam in the morning, condemned the second son to death by his spurning of the first, and damned all Cain's offspring in perpetuity. Not a promising start. Now two pages further on he's going to destroy every living thing on the earth, save for a drunkard, peeping Tom and a few others, and blame it all on us. And he again failed in whatever plan he had because by page 12, men were building a tower up to heaven and God had to pop down and spread them over the face of the earth and confuse their tongues to stop them. Page 14, God brings down great plagues on Pharaoh's house. Why? Because Pharaoh took Sari, Abraham's wife, into his house. Apparently Pharaoh had a kind of thing for 65 year old women. Pharaoh took Sari in because he did not know that Sari was Abraham's wife, because Abraham had told Pharaoh that Sari was his sister, which in fact she was, as well as being his wife. And Pharaoh, being completely honourable, rebuked Abram for his deceit as he would never have taken Sari had he known she was married. And so God punished Pharaoh for, well, answers on a postcard. Page 17. We find Sari is made barren by God, apparently as a test of Abram's faith, though of course an omniscient God would know the commitment of Abram's faith. And so Sari tells 86-year-old Abram to rape her slave, Hagar. And Hagar gets pregnant with a child that Sari will by custom take and pass off as her own. Hagar gets miffed at Sari for allowing wrinkly Abraham to rape her, so Sari beats her and brands her as a slave. Hagar runs away, but God sends an angel to tell her to return to Sari to be tortured some more, and Hagar bears a son, Ishmael. Now by page 18, God was obviously getting bored, so he decides to change Abram's name to Abraham, and Sari gets a name changed to Sarah. But the big story on page 18 is God's command that Abram circumcise all males. So although God had created man in his perfect image, apparently the foreskin was an imperfection. Or perhaps the foreskin is actually the sprue, that little bit left over from the casting of man that God had forgotten to trim off with his craft knife. I leave it as an exercise for the listener to determine where the female sprue might have been. And still on page 18, having gone a little off thread, God then immediately tries to draw us back in by injecting a little does ex machina into proceedings, a difficult trick in a book about the acts of God, but he pulls it off brilliantly by actually appearing in the flesh to Abraham completely with two fleshy angels, and the four of them sit down under a tree and eat a hearty meal together. Then, perhaps as compensation for forcing a wrinkly old man to hack off the end of his penis, God tells Abraham that he, God, will soon impregnate Abraham's wrinkly old wife. Sarah has a good laugh about this, she is 90 after all. Page 20, God completely destroys Sodom and Gomorrah and a few other cities, apparently he couldn't find 10 decent men there and so every decent woman, child and baby 
in every living thing required extermination. One assumes that Sodom and Gomorrah had spontaneously become sinful, otherwise God would surely have intervened in a lesser way at an earlier date. I mean, it isn't like he enjoys wiping out evil, is it? Before destroying the city, he does send in two angels to save Virtuous Lot, and the angels are not put off by the fact that Virtuous Lot offers up his two young virgin daughters to be raped to death by a baying mob. So God saves Lot, his wife, and two daughters, leaving the rest of their family to burn. And having saved the four of them, he turns Lot's wife into a pillar of salt, for looking over her shoulder, the sinful bitch. And of course, the good man Lot then has sex with both his virgin daughters. What a good family it was that God decided to save. One can only imagine what the newborn babies and animals in Sodom and Gomorrah were getting up to if, if they deserved to be burned alive and Lot and his sinful, incestuous bitches deserved saving. Bless the Lord. Page 22, and God threatens to kill Abimelech for innocently taking Sarah, who was obviously improving with age. Now, why did Abimelech take her? Because Abraham had said she was his sister, of course, which uh, she was, of course, as well as his wife, and about a hundred years old. And God sealed all the female wombs in Abimelech's house because of his innocent mistake. Even though God tells Abimelech that he knows he had done nothing sinful, and God only opens the wombs after Abraham prays to him. Page 23, God comes to visit 90-year-old Sarah, and she gets pregnant, with no assistance from Abraham required, and thus was Isaac conceived. Sarah now decides that the slave she allowed her husband to rape and her 17-year-old progeny should be banished. Abraham does not agree, but God intervenes and tells Abraham that Sarah is perfectly correct in banishing the slave she submitted to rape and the 17-year-old progeny of that rape. Absurdly, Hagar then bodily carries her 17-year-old son off into the parched desert, and when their water is gone, she throws this man into a bush. So either Hagar was one strong biatch, or Ishmael was one wimpy Jude. Hagar then departs as she does not want to see her 17-year-old baby die, but God appears and shows her a nearby well. And so Ishmael survives to become the forefather of the Arab races and hunt big whales. Page 25, God orders Abraham to kill his son, only staying his knife hand at the very last moment. Apparently the whole thing is a test of Abraham's faith. Now Abraham's 100 years old, and God has known him his whole life, and being omniscient, God knows precisely what is in Abraham's heart, and that Abraham would do his bidding. So this whole story is a pure act of mental torture perpetrated by God. Page 26, Sarah dies at this tender age of 127. Page 27, and Abraham decides his 40-year-old virgin son, Isaac, needs a wife, and who better than a kissing cousin? So he sends off a slave to buy one from his brother's flock, and he comes back with Rebecca, Isaac's second cousin. Page 30, Abraham, aged about 140, takes a new wife, Keturah, and has six sons with her, and we can assume several daughters. Abraham snubs Ishmael, his firstborn, and makes Isaac his heir, and then dies at the age of 175. Page 31, and Isaac is impatient that Rebecca is barren after 19 years of marriage. God intervenes, and Rebecca falls with twins. She notices them fighting in her womb. God tells her that they will always fight. She gives birth to Esau and Jacob, and sometimes later, Jacob cons Esau into renouncing his birthright. Page 32, Abimelech, remember him? gets caught out again, though he may just be a namesake. Isaac, a chip off the old block, tells Abimelech that Rebecca, his wife, is actually his sister, which surprisingly, she is not. But luckily, Abimelech notices the deception early this time and no harm befalls his house. You would have thought that Isaac would have learnt not to carry out his deception from his father Abraham. After all the trouble, Abraham caused Pharaoh and Abimelech. And we must assume that Isaac knew these stories, or else how did Moses know of them all those years later when he <coughs> wrote the details down? Page 33. Esau upsets Isaac by not marrying a cousin, and rather marrying two foreign bints, even though he was 40 and probably old enough to make up his own mind. Jacob then tricks Isaac into believing he is Esau, and Isaac on his deathbed makes Jacob his heir, thinking he is making Esau his heir. When he realises what he's done, and that he's been duped, he does nothing, even though he could simply have said Esau is my heir, as I stated, and Jacob would not have had a hairy leg to stand on. Absurd. Page 36. Isaac decides that it's time his 77-year-old virgin son Jacob gets a wife, so sends him off to marry a kissing cousin, daughter of his mother's brother, and of course 77 year old Isaac does exactly what daddy orders. Page 38. Jacob meets and falls for cousin Rachel and agrees to work for her old man Laban for seven years to get his girl. But Laban tricks Jacob into marrying his younger cousin Leah. So Jacob marries both his cousins and agrees to serve Laban for a total of 14 years. He then gets busy bedding both of the sisters. But God decides to make Rachel barren, whilst Leah spits out rugrats at an awesome rate. Rachel gets a little miffed and has Jacob rape her slave Bilhar so as to have a child with him by proxy. And just to be sure, Jacob carries on raping Bilhar and she has another child. Now Leah dries up, but not to be outdone, she passes her maid Zilpah on to Jacob, and Jacob rapes Zilpah too, and she produces, and he rapes her some more, and she produces again. Then Leah does some praying, and drops another one, and another one, and another, and finally God gets around to removing his curse on Rachel, and she has her first son, Joseph. Rachel's father then tricks Jacob into working for him even longer, and then tries to trick Jacob one last time with the old goat switcheroo. God helps Jacob out by causing any goat that looks at a stripy stick to 
have stripy kids. Jacob does a runner with his family and goats, and Rachel's old man chases him, but they eventually part friends, which leaves Jacob to try to make up with Esau. He's a bit scared of doing this. God helps out by popping down to earth, and 97-year-old Jacob and naked God spend a night man wrestling in the dark, which God enjoys so much that in the morning he changes Jacob's name to Israel. And so that is the story of how this lying, cheating, defrauding, stealing, bigamous rapist became the figurative head of an entire nation of Israel and its peoples.